Joining me now is Maryland Congressman and member of the January 6th Committee, Jamie Raskin. It is so great to have you here. And I should note that you are here because you just received the Attorney of the Year Award from the American Lawyer Magazine. So congratulations, Congressman. Thanks for having me over. Don't be bashful. It's a good big deal. Well, I've tried um, one major case in my life, and that was the Donald Trump impeachment. Well, and it ended up with a 57 to 43 vote, which sounds like a victory, but we didn't get to two thirds. Well, so he wasn't convicted. I, I think that that is one of those cases that will go down in history. And for that, you seem very deserving of the award. But I want to get your sense of what's happening right now and, and how you are feeling about the results as we have them thus far. I feel great about the results. Do you feel like democracy is in better hands? I feel encouraged. I feel emboldened. Um, you know, people were running around saying that America was going to fall for this wall of, you know, dark money propaganda about crime and inflation, which was an absolute distraction from the fact that Joe Biden has presided over a huge economic comeback mm -hmm. for America. And the fact that they um, endangered our democracy to the point of um, encouraging a violent insurrection against the government and trying to stage a coup against our constitutional order. And the American people showed that even in uh, a midterm election, when the pendulum tends to swing to the out party, even under those conditions, yeah. the people are going to stand for democracy, for freedom, and the idea of social progress. So uh, the Democrats are hanging tough. And uh, that's all over the country. I'm so proud of my colleagues across America uh, who have fought so hard under very difficult conditions. I mean, uh, McCarthy went out and raised hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. in corporate dark money to lie about what's taking place in the country. And the people rejected it. And our candidates, um, some of whom won, like Abigail Spamberger, some of whom lost, like Tom Malinowski, some who are still on the line tonight. Elaine Loria. Uh, uh, yeah, and Elaine didn't win, but I'm so proud of everyone mm -hmm. for hanging tough for America. And look, when we were growing up, we had two major parties that were pro-democracy. Today, we've got one democracy party. Well, and I wonder sort of what the implications of that are for the work that you're doing, for example, on the January 6th committee. Are you guys preparing for a potential Republican takeover? It doesn't seem likely that Kevin McCarthy will be a big fan of continuing the important work you've been doing on behalf of American democracy. Well, first of all, because we believe in transparency and accountability, we're going to get all of the critical information out okay. to America. We're going to preserve all of our records, so nothing gets destroyed. Um, and uh, we're going to issue a final report, which uh, recounts the former president's systematic assault on the constitutional order and attempt to seize the presidency. But it's also going to look at what were the structural conditions that allowed him to do that. The attack on uh, elections, the domestic violent extremist groups, the fact that... Um, the extremist groups were running wild on social media mm -hmm. and using it for logistical coordination of their plans for the assault on the Capitol um, and some of the other you know, ingredients that took place. So it's going to be more in-depth and more detailed about everything that we found. And it will conclude with a set of legislative recommendations about how to prevent coups, insurrections, political violence and electoral sabotage in this century. That seems like an important set of conclusions for everybody to get a hold of. I, you know, it's not lost on anyone that Donald Trump is supposed to testify to the committee uh, next Monday. Is it your expectation that he will testify? Do you intend to hold him in contempt of Congress if he doesn't? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't want to get to those hypotheticals. I mean, one would think that a guy who, you know, brags on the social media, who brags at his rallies about uh, everything that happened, he's already floating mass pardons for people who were convicted of seditious conspiracy and conspiracy to interfere with the federal proceeding, would come forward as a former president of the United States of America to testify yeah. about why he feels that way. And we have had more than a thousand people come forward. It's just a handful of people directly around him who think that somehow they're above the law. But as we saw in the Steve Bannon case, they're not. Uh, when anybody is subpoenaed to come and testify before Congress or a court, they have a legal obligation to do it. And if not, they're acting in contempt of Congress or the court. That sort of sounds like maybe he'll be charged with contempt of Congress. I mean, do, do you, Trump is also dangling out as recently as a few hours ago this idea that he's going to announce his candidacy for the presidency. 
on Tuesday. Does that affect the work that you do? I mean, how much is that in the, your sort of front? Well, your the, how much are you thinking about that? How much is the committee considering that? Well, I mean, as a legal proposition, it's of course perfectly irrelevant in terms of crimes committed. If you commit a crime, mm -hmm. whether it's you know, incitement to insurrection or interference with a federal proceeding or seditious conspiracy or murder or theft or whatever it might be, the fact that you're going to run for another office doesn't somehow immunize you from a prosecution. And people should understand that. So don't think that you can just go out, commit a crime, rob a bank, and then declare that you're running for city council and you're going to be okay. Right. It doesn't work like that. So I think it's irrelevant from a legal and juridical perspective. Um, from a political perspective, obviously, we're concerned because we think that our constitutional democracy is under attack. Yeah. By these people. And, you know, the political scientists tell us that the features of an authoritarian political party are they don't accept the results of democratic elections when they don't go their way. They embrace political violence and they operate as a cult of authoritarian personality. So when we were in the impeachment trial, I told all the Republican senators I could talk to, you've got to do this for the country, mm -hmm. you've got to do this for the Constitution, but you've got to do it for your political party, too, because he will destroy your political party. And I think they're beginning to see a little bit of that in terms of the referendum that was effectively on Trumpism that happened on, on Tuesday. As, as the public has been focused on the midterms, the committee has not stopped working. And in particular, you guys have been interviewing members of the Secret Service about what happened on January 6th. And we know from public reporting that you interviewed the driver of the president's SUV on January 6th. Um, does anything that you've heard in that um, in, in that testimony conflict with what we heard from Cassidy Hutchinson in her test in her account of the events. Well, I don't want to talk about the details of specific people's testimony, but I will tell you that nothing I've seen anywhere in this process contradicts Cassidy Hutchinson's account in any way that undermines my confidence um, in her testimony uh, and the accuracy of what she was reporting. And I mean, Vice President Pence, in his um, op-ed that was published today. Yes. Um, basically recounts the episode of being taken down by the Secret Service into an undisclosed location in a parking garage and repeating, I'm not getting in that car. I mean, stating that that's what he said, which to me are six of the most chilling words of the, certainly this episode, if not all of American history. Like, he knew that if he was taken away, there was going to be an effort to stage a coup and to continue with the Trump's effort to just steal the election on the floor. And he said he's not getting in the car until the Electoral College votes were counted. So to my mind, uh, a vice president who showed uh, for most points of Trump's presidency nothing other than invertebrate sycophancy on that day earned his salary and demonstrated himself to be a constitutional patriot on that day. And in that op-ed that's an excerpt from his book, he effectively corroborates that there was a pressure campaign on him to not certify the electors from states. That was the whole thing. Trump was trying to get him to step outside of his constitutional role and just obliterate and vaporize electoral college votes from Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, just disappear the votes of tens of millions of people.